All right, so this video is going to be a super fun introduction to topology, the idea of compactness, and a proof of this famous result that any closed interval a comma b is compact. I'm going to motivate what compactness is, intro concepts of topology for everyone. It's accessible for everyone in a way that makes the proof super intuitive and simple. Okay, and it's going to be all in quick time. So let's first dive into what compactness means and then get into the proof. So compactness, first of all, I'm going to briefly talk about openness. What does it mean for something to be open? So here's some kind of blob in the plane. Now, what I'm going to consider is what's inside the blob, not on the boundary of the blob. And we describe this as open because the key principle is that any point inside the blob, there is some wiggle room. There's some sufficiently small number, positive number. So if you wiggle a distance of that number in any direction to kind of get this disk, it's still going to be in the blob. Now that wiggle room gets smaller and smaller as you approach the boundary of the blob. If you're here, the wiggle room is much, much smaller than it was here. Okay, here in fact you have much more wiggle room than what I've even drawn. This is what is called an open set, when there's always a wiggle room inside the set and you can wiggle inside and you can still stay in the set. Now open sets very intuitively, I'm not going to go into all the you know, subtleties with them, but very intuitively they don't contain boundary points. Because if you had a boundary point, if you included, if you started including points here, the set would no longer be open. Because basically if you wiggle in this direction, it's fine, you're in the set. But if you wiggle in the other direction, you go outside. Okay, so that wouldn't be open anymore. So open is when there is a wiggle room for every point in the set. Okay, fairly simple. Now what we're going to do is we're going to get to what compactness means. And I'm briefly going to mention that in the number line, so that was in the plane, that's in R2. You can think of it in, in the plane. In the number line, you know, classical examples of open sets are just open intervals. Okay, there's always a wiggle room. As you approach the boundary of the interval, you wiggle, you can only wiggle less to stay inside the interval, but you still have some wiggle room. But as soon as you have the boundary point, like if you have a closed interval, then it's no longer open. Okay, so as it's indicated, closed, okay, it's no longer open because you don't have wiggle room at the boundary point. If you wiggle in the right direction, you'll no longer be inside the interval if it's closed. Okay, so what does it mean to be compact in saying all that? So compact basically means the following. I'm going to say the definition and then make it intuitive. Okay, so here's the definition. Um, and we're going to focus on sets inside the real number line. Okay, it's, it's the same idea outside, but I'm going to focus on the number line. So a subset A contained in R is compact. Okay, so a subset A contained in R is compact. Um, if every open cover of A, and I'll explain what this is. Okay, so bear with me. If every open cover of A has a finite subcover. Okay, and um, how someone came up with this definition, I'm going to explain intuitively what the idea is. Now, this definition works for RD as well. It doesn't have to be inside the number line. The idea is that any real valued continuous function on the set should be bounded. That's the rough idea of compactness. That's at its core. If you think about calculus, the extreme value theorem. A continuous function on a closed interval is bounded. So closed intervals are supposed to be compact. But open intervals are not, because you can have a function like 1 over x on the open interval 0, 1. It's continuous, but not bounded, goes to infinity at 0. So compactness is meant to ensure that. But what does open cover mean? What does subcover mean? So let's unentangle this definition. Open cover means the following. Suppose I have some set. Okay, again, I'm going to maybe look at, look at the, you know, uh, R2. Okay, look at the plane. Okay, this is a blob. An open cover is a collection of open sets that covers everything. So let's look at everything inside this blob and even on the boundary if you like. Okay, so this is not an open set, it's just some set inside R2. It's a blob and it's boundary points. Now an open cover is just a bunch of open sets. So the classic examples are just disks, you know, disks without the boundary. So what's inside the disk? Okay, so there's always a wiggle room inside the disk, not on the boundary. And you can cover them with overlapping. They could be overlapping, it doesn't matter. But you can sort of, I'm going to do a big one here just to save myself some time because otherwise it'll be a while. Um, I could just cover this A by all these open sets, these disks, and that's what's called an open cover. Now it doesn't have to be disks, it can be blobs themselves. You know, blobs are open, like what's inside this blob is open. So it could be pretty weird. Um, and that's what's considered to be an open cover. And you could have infinitely many, okay? So you could make the disks even smaller. You could imagine, instead of having a big disk like that, I could have taken lots of small, small, even smaller and smaller disks and eventually cover everything in A. And it's not at all obvious, why should there only need to be a finite number of them that still suffice, okay? So you could sort of cover them by infinitely many, 
why should you know that they can only suffice a finite number of them? I'll give you an example of something that's not compact before going to something that is compact. Let me show you something that's not compact, okay? Let's go inside the real number line. The number line itself is not compact, okay? So this is going to be the number line itself. I can find an open cover that has no finite subcover. What I do is I take all intervals of the form minus n comma n, where n is a natural number, okay? So this minus one comma one, then minus two comma two, then minus three comma three. Now, this is a series of enlarging open intervals and it's the cover of the number line. It's cool because it never ever reaches infinity, but it keeps going towards infinity. So every real number is in one of these open intervals. You know, just choose a sufficiently big one. But you cannot suffice with only a finite number of them. Because if you have only a finite number of them, you'll only cover a finite part of the line. You'll not cover numbers that are really large or really you know, negative on the left-hand side of the number line. So this is something that is not compact because there is an open cover that has no finite subcover. What we're going to prove is that in the case of a closed interval, every open cover is a finite subcover. And I'm tracking well, I'm at six minutes. And if you're enjoying this content, math made easy. This is hard math, okay? This is taught in topology classes, third year level math sometimes in, in university for serious math majors. Like and subscribe and also consider supporting my channel on Patreon, okay? I love making free math content and I'm doing everything on my own, but with small support on Patreon, I can really go a long way to making math accessible for a worldwide audience and really outsource a lot of the work. But let's just dive into the video and you can find a Patreon link in the description and there are exclusive perks if you sign up. But let's get into this proof now of why this closed interval AB is compact. So I've got this definition. So here's the proof and it's going to be super simple, okay? Um, but it's going, to uncover, it's going to uncover a lot of ideas. So I'm going to just motivate it very briefly before diving into the argument. So how can we, so the way I try to prove a theorem as a mathematician is I try to think about why would the theorem be false, okay? So can I actually find an open cover of the closed interval that has no finite subcover? What could I do? So imagine the interval on the number line, okay? This is AB. Now what I could do is I could, to make an infinite number of open sets that covers it, that where a finite number is not enough, what I can do is I can sort of take these intervals and they could sort of get smaller and smaller, okay? So it could be adding up smaller and smaller numbers, kind of like a geometric series, half plus one fourth plus one eighth, et cetera. And it never quite reaches an, inf it just reaches a finite number. And then you could sort of keep going like that. And you could sort of imagine you could construct infinitely many of these open intervals. They're all open sets, they cover AB, but you don't, you're not able to cover this closed interval AB with only a finite number of them. Now, why doesn't this happen? Because what we're proving is this doesn't happen. So why doesn't it happen? If you think about it, if you imagine these intervals kind of cascading like this and getting smaller and smaller, the point is they'll eventually hit some kind of limit. And at that limit, it looks like you needed an infinite number of intervals to cover everything up to and including that limit. But here's the catch. The catch is that because the original cover was an open cover of the whole interval, every point inside A comma B is in one of them. And so in particular, this so-called limiting point is actually in one of them. And what that means is that you only need this and a finite number of these ones that are cascading to cover that bunch. You did not need, because they were getting smaller and smaller was fine, it looked like you needed all of them, and you may need all of them if you are dealing with something like A comma B, where it's open-ended at B, it doesn't include B. But as soon as you're including this point, you know that an open set in the cover contains that point, and that's going to eliminate the need of infinitely many of them approaching that point. Okay, that's the rough idea. And we're gonna make that very precise in the following way. And this is gonna be the proof, so let's get into it. And drop a comment down below if you have any thoughts or questions. You know, this is hard math, I'm, con I'm condensing it. I'm basically explaining this to calculus students. You don't need to know any math. Even even don't even need to know calculus. It's just, you know, basically visual intuition. But let's kind of get into it now. So what's the proof? So here's gonna be the argument. I'm going to say, how far can I go? So remember with the intuition we looked at, we sort of had these intervals are getting smaller and smaller, so it looked like you, you, you kind of need infinitely many of them to cover everything, okay? So that gives us an idea. We're going to define the following, okay? So let S, I'm going to define a set. Let S be the set of all X such that the interval A comma X has a finite subcover, 
we're basically saying that how far along the interval a, b can we go so that only a finite number of these open intervals suffices. Okay, so let s be the set of all x so that a comma x is a finite subcover. We have fixed an open cover. Okay, so fix an open cover. Fix an open cover of a, b, and we can ask. We can consider this set. This is how far we go starting from a, so that we we can do it with a finite number of of, of open sets in the cover. Now, if b is in S, then the theorem is proven. Because if b is in S, then a comma b has a finite subcover. And we're done because every open cover has a finite subcover. That's all good. So we need to prove that b is in S. What do we know about S? Okay, what, what do we kind of think about S? So what we know about S is first of all, a is in S. Why? Because the closed interval a comma a is just going to equal to the single element set consisting of a. And that is compact. Okay, that I mean that has a finite subcover because any open cover of AB, every point in AB is in one of the open sets. So in particular, A is in one of the open sets. So that single open set will be the finite subcover of just A. Okay, so A is in S. Okay, done. So S is non-empty. S has something in it, something to play with. Now S being a non-empty bounded set of real numbers, okay, it's going to have a least upper bound. Okay, so whatever S is, it's a collection of numbers. There's going to be a smallest number, which we can call, let's call it C. There is a smallest number C, so that C is greater than every element of S, okay? So C is smallest such that C is going to be greater than or equal to S, every element of S. C is greater than or equal to little s for all little s in big S, okay? That's going to be what is called a least upper bound. This is the least upper bound property of the real numbers. There is a smallest thing greater than everything in S, okay? Because S is a bounded set. Now that we have that, we're going to do something cool. We don't know that C is in S itself, okay? We don't know that. But we're going to do something. So let's, let's get into it. We've got this C. It's the least upper bound of S. We're going to do two things. We're first going to prove it's in S. Then we're going to prove it's equal to B. Okay, so let's get into it. We're almost done with the proof. And it's going to be a, basically a generalization of the intuition we had earlier. Okay, so first of all, why is C in S? Okay, why is C in S? Well, here's going to be the idea. What we do is consider C. We know that C is the least upper bound of S, okay? We know it's the least upper bound of S. We know that the original open cover of AB, there is one open set containing C, okay? So let U be an open set. Let U be an open set in the open cover, okay? So one of the things in the open cover, such that C is in U, okay? Such that C is in U, okay? We pick that. Now, because U is open, remember the wiggle room idea? If wiggle C and left or right, you'll still remain in U. So what that means is that there's going to be some epsilon, okay? So there exists epsilon greater than zero, such that um, C minus epsilon comma C plus epsilon is contained in U. Okay, so you can picture this in the number line. You've got this little wiggle room around C that's contained inside U. Now we know the following. The C minus epsilon, we know that C minus epsilon is going to be less than C, and because C was the least upper bound of S, it was the smallest upper bound of everything in S, there's going to be some number in S, let's call it S prime, that's going to be between C minus epsilon and C. If not, C minus epsilon would be a smaller upper bound. So pick that S prime, okay? We know that because S prime is in S, A comma S prime has a finite subcover. Okay, so A comma S prime has a finite subcover. So you can write it out as follows has a finite subcover on the original open cover, which we can label as u1 up to uk. Okay, some finite number of them. Okay, cover a up to s prime. Now here's the cool thing. If u1 up to uk cover a up to s prime, then we know that u1 up to uk comma u covers a up to c. That's beautiful, right? Because we know that u contains this wiggle room. We know this s prime between a and s prime, we know we have covered them with a finite number u1 up to uk. So therefore, u1 up to uk together with this u is going to cover all the things from a to c. We've taken, it's the same idea. If they kind of got smaller and smaller and limited at c, we've taken one of the sets in the open cover containing c, and that eliminates the need for the infinitude of, the of how many are needed from a up to c. And then with that u, we know that because this c, s prime is going to be in s, we can cover that with u1 up to uk from a to s prime, and we're done. So that means that C, A up to C has a finite subcover. We just needed one more. We needed U1 up to UK 
and you. Now we're almost there. Why are we almost there? Because all we need to do now is we know that C is in, C is in S, we know C is in S, and now we're going to show that C has to equal to B. So let's do that. Let's prove that C equals to B. We know that C is in S, let's prove C is equal to B. So what we're going to do is the following. C is in S, C is the maximum element of S now. Earlier we said least upper bound. There's a distinction between least upper bound and maximum. Maximum means it's in the set. Least upper bound means it may not be in the set, but it's bigger than everything in the set, okay? It's the smallest thing bigger than everything in the set. But now we know it's in the set, so it is just categorically the maximum. Now, because we know that C is in S, it's a maximum, nothing bigger than C can be in S. But the same argument now applies, because here's the thing. We know that since C is in S, there is a finite collection of sets, V1 up to Vn, open sets in the cover, open sets in the open cover, the original open cover of the closed interval, such that the interval A up to C is going to be contained inside the union, V1 union dot 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 union Vn. Okay, it's going to be covered by V1 up to Vn. But we know that because each of them is open, one of them contains C, open sets means wiggle room. So you've gone from A to C, you know one of them, let's say the ith one, doesn't matter what it is, okay? It's going to contain some interval containing C, but that would mean that this open cover of A to C is actually an open cover of A to something slightly bigger than C. Let's say C plus epsilon for some epsilon greater than zero. And that means that C plus epsilon is in S for some epsilon greater than zero, which is absurd because S had, we know that C was the maximum element of S. So that is a contradiction, unless of course, there's nothing bigger than C. And the only way that can happen, so the only way that C can be in S is if C is equal to B. So C was the maximum possible element in the interval AB. So therefore we conclude that C is equal to B. And therefore our original AB has a finite subcover. Compactness is proven. And I've just done this, you know, in, in a short amount of time, roughly 15 minutes, okay? Roughly 15 minutes. I've proven something that's typically proven in topology. Okay, it's taught in topology. There are lots of other proofs that are quite a lot more involved. I've taught you what open sets are, taught you what compactness is, given you a proof. It may take some time to absorb, but drop questions down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts, happy to engage with you. I'm trying to make elite math super accessible. I'm a research mathematician, so if you're enjoying my content again, don't forget to like and subscribe. Drop comments, I love them, they really go a long way. And share with people, you know, share with people who are interested in high level math, know a little bit of math, learning calculus, they can understand this video, you know, they can get into it. So share it with them and I'm super excited to see you in the next video. Wish you all the best and check out my other content. I've got super fun videos on my channel across all levels. You can check one out, out over here or over here. You're gonna love either of them. I'm super excited to see you in one of those videos.